we are going to start with Act 4, Scene 1. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all the rest of the play, but I'm going to read a lot of it. Um, and we're going to see the two parallel plots come together, uh, the Gloucester story and the Lear story. And they come together with such poignance that, um, that um, I'm telling you now, I'm not going to be entirely responsible for my emotions during some of this. I may be master of them, and I may not. We'll see. <laughs> some years I am, some years I'm not. So act four, scene one, enter Edgar. Yet better thus and known to be contemned than still contemned and flattered. Still meaning always contemned and flattered. To be worst is the lowest and most dejected thing of fortune stands still in esperance. That means hope lives not in fear. The lamentable change or the lamentable changes from the best. The worst returns to laughter. Welcome then, thou unsubstantial air that I embrace. The wretch that thou hast blown unto the worst owes nothing to thy blast. I don't owe you anything. I'm at the worst that I can be. I'm the lowest thing. No clothes, no friends, pretending to be a madman. And he's in for a shock. Enter Gloucester, an old man. Gloucester's been blinded, remember? But who comes here, my father poorly led or party eyed in the other text, in the, in the uh, I don't know which this is, the quarto or the folio. World, world, oh world. But that thy strange mutations make us hate thee, life would not yield to age. We wouldn't give up life with age if we didn't come to hate life because of its mutations, changeability, chaos. So uh, the old man says to Gloucester, you cannot see your way. And Gloucester says, I have no way and therefore want no eyes. I stumbled when I saw, which is a wonderful moment of self-knowledge, although he's not at his final stage of that yet. And then he prays for Edgar. Dear son Edgar, the fruit of thy abused father's wrath, might I but live to see thee in my touch, I'd say I had eyes again. If I could touch you, I would say I had eyes. You would be my eyes. Now, why doesn't Edgar run forward and say, it's me, it's me, here I am. First, he says, oh, gods, who is it can say I'm at the worst? I'm worse than e'er I was. And worse I may be yet. The worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Through that door and downstairs. <laughs> You're obviously part of the music crowd, not the Shakespeare crowd. <laughs> Good. Come back sometime. Um, the worst is not so long as we can say this is the worst. Why? Because if you can say this is the worst, what have you got? Life. <laughs> Life. More. Speech. Reason. Judgment. Um, the old man says he's a madman and a beggar, Edgar is, uh, and Gloucester says he has some reason else he could not beg. In the last night's storm I such a fellow saw before I lost my eyes, which made me think a man a worm. My son came then into my mind. Irony. And yet my mind was then scarce friends with him, I have heard more since. And then here's his conclusion, his temporary conclusion, but he doesn't know it's temporary. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. Now, I can't tell you how many people I've argued with who think this is the essence of King Lear. This is the point of the play. We finally got to the meat. Shakespeare was so smart that he was a 20th century existentialist <laughs> before his time. And the play's not over yet. And they don't pay any attention to what happens later in the light of this, because it's such a persuasive line. Edgar, aside, how should this be? 
Bad is the trade that must play fool to sorrow, angering itself and others. Bless thee, master, and he goes back into his mad routine. He sees his father's in despair. So he doesn't reveal himself yet. But he's going to lead him. The times plague when the madmen lead the blind, says Gloucester. Do as I bid thee, or rather do thy pleasure above the rest be gone. The old man, who's one of the last virtuous people left in England at the moment, says, I'll bring him the best apparel that I have, come on it what will. He could die for it, because they have told him not Regan and Cornwall and so on. Said, don't take care of this man. Poor Tom's a cold, says Edgar. I cannot daub it further. I can't paint it. I can't pretend. And yet I must. So he goes into his mad routine. Gloucester, here, take this purse, whom, thou whom the heavens' plagues have humbled to all strokes. That I am wretched makes thee the happier. Heavens deal so still. Let the superfluous and lust dieted man that slaves your ordinance, that will not see because he does not feel, feel your power quickly. So distribution should undo excess and each man have enough. Does this sound familiar? I know it's been a week. Lear said the same thing. He started to take off his clothes in his madness. Do you remember? to shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. And Gloucester is saying the same thing. He's suddenly recognizing that he's got all these accoutrements and he hasn't pitied the poor wretch. And he's pitying him now. And he's praying that things be somewhat equalized. Of course, he's not praying to Stalin or Lenin who are gonna equalize everything by killing people who resist. This is the beginnings of charity. And then he says, take me to the cliff at Dover. Why? Because uh, from that place I shall know leading need. I'm done. Okay, Act 4, Scene 2. I'm just going to point out, I mean, I'm not going to read all of these intermediate scenes. Um, I'll point out a few lines. One is the irony of Oswald speaking to Goneril. He's come back uh, to her side of the map. Hello. And he says, um, of Gloucester's treachery and of the loyal service of his son, meaning Edmund, loyal service to Cornwall, which is, of course, disloyal to the king and to Gloucester. When I informed him, he's talking now, about um, Albany. Remember what the first thing in the play we heard about Albany? The king more affected Albany than Cornwall? Turns out he was right, wasn't he? Albany is a good guy, basically. Cornwall, vile. Of Gloucester's treachery and of the loyal service of his son when I informed him, then he called me sot and told me I had turned the wrong side out, which was true. Right? Oswald's on the wrong side. He's on the side of Goneril, Edmund. What most he should dislike seems pleasant to him, what like, offensive. The irony, of course, is that it's the other way around. What most Oswald should dislike seems pleasant to him, what like, offensive. He's reversed it. So he thinks Albany should like Goneril's advancement and Edmund's advancement and the blinding of Gloucester and all this. Um, and of course, he shouldn't like it. So it's just the world is now upside down. And the conversation that Oswald reports between himself and Albany illustrates that. And then Albany says it in another way. She says to him when he meets her, I have been worth the whistle. That is, I've been worth greeting when I come home. He says, oh, Goneril, you are not worth the dust which the rude wind blows in your face. Which is very pleasant to hear. Finally, somebody telling her off, besides Lear. She says, no more, the text is foolish. And Albany says, wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. Filths savor but themselves. 
Now, I think you could take this and apply it in a whole lot of ways. Wisdom and goodness to the vile seem vile. The people who reject wisdom and goodness become vile in doing so. And then justifying themselves in that vileness, they see goodness and virtue as vile. So it's that same reversal of all value. Everything's upside down. Tigers, not daughters, what have you performed? A father and a gracious aged man whose reverence even the head-lugged bear would lick. Most barbarous, most degenerate, have you madded? If that the heavens do not their visible spirits send quickly down to tame these vile offenses, it will come. Humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep. Without the values, without any sense of reverence, without hierarchy, without the recognition of wisdom and goodness as distinct from vileness, humanity preys on itself like monsters of the deep. We become nothing but animals if we behave like animals. Then she yells at him for being weak and meek-livered and all the rest. Uh, Kent and the gentleman in the next scene. So that's advancing the plot. I just would say, uh, quote the gentleman on Cordelia at uh, Act 4, Scene 3, Line 16. They describe the condition of the king, and Kent says, then it moved her, meaning Cordelia, and the gentleman says, not to a rage, patience and sorrow strove who should express her goodliest. You have seen sunshine and rain at once. Her smiles and tears were like a better way. Those happy smilets that played on her ripe lips seemed not to know what guests were in her eyes, which parted thence as pearls from diamonds dropped. In brief, sorrow would be a rarity most beloved if all could so become it. She's got smiles and tears. This is not smiles of happiness. This is smiles of what he told us in the first line, patience. And remember we talked about patience? Pati from patior in Latin, to bear, to be willing to bear. Not wait, necessarily, but put up with. So she's struggling to be patient, to, sub, to, to bear with this uh, disaster of fortune. And she's also sorrowful for her father's sake. So the sorrow is the tears. And the smiles are the patience. And they're both working because they're both virtues. Right? They're trying to, they're, they're competing for whether she's going to smile or cry, but she's doing both because both are expressions of different virtues. In the next scene, she hears about Lear running mad with idle weeds making a crown of fumiter, furrow weeds, hard ox, hemlock, nettles, cuckoo flowers, darnel. Okay, this is all in contrast to the golden crown that he wore in the beginning. And she calls on nature. The doctor, of course, is the midwife between nature and, and humans. And so he can apply, because he has knowledge, the herbs of nature to heal. And he says there are means but he mainly needs rest. And Cordelia says, all blessed secrets, all you unpublished virtues of the earth, spring with my tears. Be aidant and remediate in the good man's distress. Seek, seek for him, lest his ungoverned rage dissolve the life that wants the means to lead it. After all he did to her, why doesn't she say, good, he deserves it? You know? She's not vengeful, that's right. She hasn't gone into some therapy session where they've told her to hate her parents and blame them for her troubles. <laughs> she is striving to fulfill what she claimed in the beginning. I love you according to my bond. She still and she still does, unchanged. All right, there's going to be, they get together to have a war against the invading French. Now, you know, it's a problem in the play because um, we know that Cordelia is leading, 
not as a military officer as they show us in the last two films I've seen, but anyway, she, it's in her name, in the King of France's name, that the French forces have come to restore Lear and reestablish order in the kingdom. And on the other side, on the English side, you've got the good guy Albany and the bad guy Cornwaller, his forces anyway, coming together to throw off a French invasion. Well, when was the French invasion uh, most recent in the memory of the audience? Or not French invasion, but invasion. The Armada, 1588, the Spanish Armada. So invading England is not okay. Since 1066, it's not okay. This is happening way before that, of course. But nonetheless, the audience hears France is invading England. That's not okay. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem within the play. It's not a problem. I mean, Shakespeare knows what he's doing. The French forces have to be defeated. Cordelia cannot win in a war against the English. Not because it's Cordelia and not because France is bad, but only because it's France and this is England. Okay, so that's kind of the part of the background for the war. The, the, the good side and the evil side within England are joining forces to throw back the French army and they defeat them. But in the meantime, so Lear has been off the stage all this time, right? We haven't seen him for scene after scene after scene, and we're not going to see him until this scene, late in this scene. But first, we're going to get a heavy dose of a revelation of uh, Gloucester. So Act 4, Scene 6, Line 1. Now, in the rather thin Anthony Hopkins version I just saw on, on uh, Amazon Prime, Edgar leads him to the top of the cliffs of Dover. And he shows us the, the ocean down below. And he puts him not right at the edge, but near the edge. <sighs> Edgar really takes him to a nice, flat, sandy spot. Sandy or, or, or grassy, where he's not going to hurt himself. It's in the words that we see this great cliff and this ocean below and so on. But the words do it. When I first read this play, I thought there really was a cliff there. It's an absolutely irresistible language. And that's what the audience needed. They did not need, you know, a video in the back showing the ocean or the cliffs. I don't think we need it either, but uh, the directors don't trust the words. Gloucester, when shall I come to the top of that same hill? Edgar, you do climb up it now. Look how we labor. <laughs> Gloucester, methinks the ground is even. Who's right here? Gloucester. Yes. Edgar's lying to him. Horrible steep. Hark, do you hear the sea? No, truly. Well, what does the director do with that line when the sea is there and we're hearing it? It's just stupid. <laughs> what? Yeah, in the Hopkins version on Amazon. All right, let's forget about the movie for now. <laughs> Edgar, why then your other senses grow imperfect by your eyes' anguish? So may it be indeed, says Gloucester. Methinks thy voice is altered, and thou speakst in better phrase and matter than thou didst. You are much deceived, and nothing am I changed but in my garments. There's that word again. Nothing. He's lying again. And Shakespeare has taken Gla I mean Edgar, and watch how he uses his language. We, we had all that poor Tom madness, right? Flibberty gibbet stuff. Now we've got him being, sounding like a fairly rational servant. Watch what he does. Methinks you are better spoken. Edgar, come on, sir, here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy tis to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. So we're looking down at crows and chuffs, jackdaws, and they're, so, they're halfway down and they look like beetles. Now, He's on flat ground. We don't see that with our eyes. We see it with our ears. 
Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire, dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock, her cock a buoy, almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered pe idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. Cannot be heard so high. That isn't there. I'll look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. I mean, there cannot be a more persuasive speech about where they are. Gloucester, set me where you stand. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. For all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. I mean, I wouldn't even jump straight up, much less forward. Let go my hand. Here, friends, another jewel. Purse, sorry, in it a jewel, well worth a poor man's taking. Fairies and gods prosper it with thee. Go thou further off, bid me farewell, and let me hear thee going. Now, fare you well, good sir. <clears throat> with all my heart. Edgar, aside. Why I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. That's why he didn't talk to him before. He's got to change Gloucester's attitude. So now, Gloucester, oh, you mighty gods, this world I do renounce. And in your sights, shake patiently my great affliction off. OK, what is wrong with that sentence, logically? I've taught you enough already so you can get it. <laughs> what does the word patiently mean? <coughs> Willing to bear. How can you, if you are patient, commit suicide? That is not the definition of patience. It's not up to you to end your life in this way. He feels himself to be accepting this disaster that's happened, blaming himself, and now he's going to do away with himself. As if this were the end of his life. As if the end of his life and the end of the story of his life is in his hands. So Edgar's going to teach him that that's not true. If I could bear it longer and not so patiently, but I can't bear it, OK? There's the irony of the meaning of the word. If I could bear it longer and not fall to quarrel with your great opposeless wills, my snuff and loathed part of nature should burn itself out. If I could bear it and not oppose myself to your pre-Christian, multi-divinities, nature gods wills, I'd let my life wear itself out, but I can't. So I'm going to jump off this cliff. If Edgar live, oh, bless him. Now, fellow, fare thee well. He falls forward and faints, thinking, of course, that he's jumped off the cliff. Gone, sir, farewell. And yet, says Edgar in his own voice, I know not how conceit, that is conception, the, co the concept in the mind, the imagination in the mind, may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. You can imagine dying and your life might actually end because the power of the image. If you want to die, the power of the image might actually kill you. Had he been where he thought by this, had thought been passed, he'd be dead. Alive or dead? Ho oh, you, sir, friend. Hear you, sir, speak. Thus might he pass indeed. Yet he revives. What are you, sir? Away and let me die. Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe, hast heavy substance, bleeds not, speaks, art sound. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. One of my favorite lines, because of the word perpendicularly. 
and because it's an enjambment, and because it's about this great long fall. And this whole set, the whole line is this great long fall. 10 masts at each, meaning ma 10 masts of a ship, end to end. Make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell. Boom. Thy life's a miracle. So after that great long line of fall, we come to the point. Thy life's a miracle. Speak yet again, but have I fallen or no? From the, so Edgar, you see, is pretending to be a different person on the shore below the cliffs. What's what it was? Uh, I didn't get that he was trying to be a different person. Yeah. From the dread summit of this chalky bourne, look up a height. He's saying, look up, pretending not to know that his father's blind. The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. Alack, I have no eyes. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? You, you, you don't even have that option? Well, why hasn't he killed himself? Because Edgar's prevented him. Why has Edgar prevented him? He wants to help his father. He wants to cure his father. He loves his father, even though he's been brutally mistreated by his father. Parallel to who did we just read about? Whom did we just read about? Cordelia, the same thing. Despair. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. And, the and this despair, which leads to suicide. Why? What is despair in the, in the tradition? It's, this, it's, a, it's, it's more than that. It's a sin. It's a sin against the Holy Spirit. And it's a sin because it presumes that one is not salvageable, that one cannot be saved. That is true despair, as the church has defined it. It's the sin of certainty that your judgment of yourself trumps God's judgment of you and, and that you cannot be saved. So I'm going to, that's my peroration in, how, in an hour, I'm going to make it. But you're absolutely right. It's said in a pre-Christian world precisely in order to illustrate without doctrinal superstructure the truth of the Christian idea, which is that this despair is wrong, that God can save you even though you think he can't. So Edgar saves him. And that is God saving him. Why? Because it's love, right? Edgar loves his father still, despite all that he's suffered. Is wretchedness deprived that benefit to end itself by death? T'was yet some comfort when misery could beguile the tyrant's rage and frustrate his proud will. You could, you could always have hope that you could kill yourself at least. And that's a great classical value. The Romans did this regularly. And the great, uh, you know, heroes of the past, they got caught, they got destroyed, they got Cato of Utica commit suicide rather than become a servant and slave to the illiberal Caesar, as he believed. Give me your arm. Up, so, how is it? Feel your legs, you stand, too well, too well. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? A poor, unfortunate beggar. As I stood here below, so now we saw down from up there in our imagination. Now we're going to be looking up from down below in our imagination. As I stood here below, me thought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns whelked and waved like the enrigid sea. It was some fiend. Why is he telling him that he himself at the top of the cliff, poor Tom, was a fiend? Why does he want Gloucester to believe that? Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honors of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. He wants him to still believe the ruse that yeah, he was led by Edgar to commit suicide. I didn't understand he's, that. He's confirming what Edgar, I mean, what 
what Gloucester believed, that he was being led to the cliffs and that... Yeah, but he thought he was being led by a poor madman, and now he realizes, or he's being told, that it was a demon that led him there, right? And the gods have saved him. What? And that the gods have saved him. And that the gods have saved him. And it's not literally physically true, as we know, but it's spiritually, morally true. Because the demon that was leading him to the cliff was the demon of despair. And who saved him was his son, but an act of love. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honors of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. That's the answer to despair. You don't think you can be saved, but that's not an impossibility to the gods. And Gloucester says, I do remember now. Henceforth I'll bear affliction till it do cry out itself enough enough and die. Instead of me dying because of affliction, I'm going to bear it until the affliction dies. Saying that's enough. Affliction will say that's enough and it will die. That thing thou sp uh, you speak of, I took it for a man. Often t'would say the fiend, the fiend, he led me to that place. Edgar, bear free and patient thoughts. Enter Lear. Didn't mean to scare you, but... <laughs> Mad and bedecked with weeds, it says in the, no, in the brackets. In the um, Olivier version of the film, brilliantly, they have Gloucester with a bandage around his eyes. And they have Lear with the weeds, with a crown of weeds around his head. So the blindness, the physical blindness of Gloucester is parallel to the madness of Lear. But who comes here? Then he gets it. And then he says, the safer sense will ne'er accommodate his master thus. Gloucester's wits are not going to be able to bear seeing Lear or recognizing that Lear is mad. No, they cannot touch me for coining. I am the king himself. They can't accuse me of counterfeiting. I'm the king. I can make the money. Edgar, oh, thou side-piercing sight. In case we didn't know how we were supposed to react to the mad Lear, here's how. Nature's above art in that respect. There's your press money. That fellow handles his bow like a crow keeper. Draw me a clothier's yard. He's drawing a bow, imaginary bow. Look, look, a mouse. Peace, peace, meaning be quiet to catch the mouse. Then he uses the same word, this piece of toasted cheese will do it. There's my gauntlet. You throw down a gauntlet when you're ready to have a duel, right? You're challenging to a duel. I'll prove it on a giant, even on a giant. Bring up the brown bills, that is, bring up my soldiers with the brown bills. Oh, well flown, bird, in the clout, in the clout. You got it right into the bullseye. Phew. Phew. Then he looks at Edgar, give the word. Edgar says, meaning the password, so let him pass. He says, sweet marjoram. Why sweet marjoram? It's a cure for madness. <sighs> I warned you. Pass, says Lear. Gloucester, I know that voice. Ha! Goneril with a white beard. He's looking at Gloucester. They flattered me like a dog and told me I had the white hairs in my beard ere the black ones were there. To say I and no to everything that I said, I and no too was no good divinity. Uh, that's a reference to the gospel. Uh, let your I be I and your no be no in the, in the uh, Renaissance translations, Jesus says, meaning... Tell the truth and mean what you say, etc. But they said, I and no to everything I said. I and no too was no good divinity. You can't say both yes and no to the same thing. 
And of course they were saying yes on the surface, but no underneath in that whole first scene. Remember all that flattery. When the rain came to wet me once and the wind to make me chatter, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, when the thunder would not peace at my bidding, when I couldn't control nature, there I found them, there I smelt them out. Go to, they are not men of their words. They told me I was everything. Tis a lie. I am not ague proof. So he's mad, but he's humbled in a sense. Not completely. It's not, the process isn't done yet. But he's changing and we can see it in his madness. Gloucester, the trick of that voice I do well remember, is it not the king? Aye, every inch a king. When I do stare, see how the subject quakes. I pardon that man's life. What was thy cause? Adultery? Why is this ironic? Why is this touching? Because that was Gloucester's crime which produced Edmund. Thou shalt not die. Die for adultery? No. The wren goes to it, and the small gilded fly does lecher in my sight. Let copulation thrive, for Gloucester's bastard son was kinder to his father than my daughter's got tween the lawful sheets. Well, no, he wasn't, but Lear doesn't know that. Do it, luxury, pell-mell, for I lack soldiers. Behold yon simpering dame, whose face between her forks presages snow. In other words, her face promises that she's chaste and, and uh, reserved and cold. But between her forks, it's another matter. That minces virtue and does shake the head to hear of pleasure's name. The fit you nor the soiled horse goes to it with a more riotous appetite. Down from the waist they are centaurs, the women all above. But to the girdle do the gods inherit. Beneath is all the fiends. There's hell, there's darkness, there's the sulfurous pit, burning, scalding, stench, consumption, <laughs> Give me an ounce of civet, good apothecary. Sweeten my imagination. There's money for thee. Of course, there's nothing, no money in his hand. He's got nothing. He is just consumed by this horror of these daughters, by the falsity of their flattery, and he's conceiving of it in sexual terms, and then in hellish terms. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me, the Earl of Gloucester, reduced to almost nothing, kiss the hand of my king, reduced to almost nothing. Oh, let me kiss that hand. Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. So you go, if you think about Act 1, Scene 1, finally, he realizes he's mortal. Can we help you? I'm sorry, I was a No. Okay. Wrong church. I think it's at the Presbyterian Church across the street. Okay, I'm so sorry. That's all right. So sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Let me wipe it first. It smells of mortality. Gloucester. Oh, ruined peace of nature. And peace here means masterpiece. Why? Because he's a king. And the king is the pinnacle of, of the human hierarchy, right? The highest thing you can be is a king. And so he is a peace. He's the masterpiece. He's human nature risen to the highest level. And then he says, this great world shall so wear out to naught. What's he mean? This is what it looks like when the world comes to an end. At the last ending doom, when everything's... Uh, reduced and, and corrupted and destroyed and about to be abolished. 
in the last judgment. This is what it's going to look like, seeing this great king come to this. O oh, ruined peace of nature, this great world shall so wear out to naught. This is what it'll look like. This is what it'll be like. Dost thou know me? I remember thine eyes well enough. <sighs> Who gets away with a line like that? What does he mean? What's he doing when he says that? I remember thine eyes well enough. It's the absence of the eyes that we know is leading to sight. Can you make no use of nothing, of eyelessness, of madness? Dost thou squinny at me, meaning squint? No, do thy worst blind Cupid. He treats Gloucester now as Cupid. I'll not love. Go ahead, shoot me with your arrow. I'm not going to fall in love at this date. Read thou this challenge. Mark but the penning of it. Of course he doesn't have a challenge. He's giving him nothing. A leaf, maybe. Were all thy letters sons I could not see. Edgar, I would not take this from report. It is, and my heart breaks at it. Read. What, with the case of eyes? With just the case that eyes go in, but not the eyes? Ho, ho, are you there with me? No eyes in your head, nor no money in your purse. Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light. Yet you see how this world goes. I see it feelingly. What, art mad? A man may see how this world goes with no eyes. Look with thine ears. See how yon justice rails upon yon simple thief. Hark in thine ear, change places and handy dandy. Which is the justice, which is the thief? Thou hast seen a farmer's dog bark at a beggar? Aye, sir. And the, creatures, and the creature run from the cur? There thou mightst behold the great image of authority. A dog's obeyed in office. Do you get this? Lear was the great image of authority in his own mind. And it wasn't obeyed because he disempowered himself. He, he flattered himself and allowed the girls to flatter him. And so he's reduced to almost nothing. And he's recognizing that authority was this illusion that you could wield without substance behind it that the mere name of king was enough. Even a dog's obeyed in office. Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thy own back. Thou hotly lust to use her in that kind for which thou whipst her. Now, all the modern psychologists are going to say, this Shakespeare is a great psychologist. Like, this is pure Freud. The usurer hangs the cousiner. OK, you catch a cousiner, and you sentence him to death, and you're going to hang him. But who's hanging him? A usurer. So he's no better than the guy he's hanging. The usurer hangs the cousiner. Through tattered clothes, small vices do appear. Robes and furred gowns hide all. Plates in with gold, and the strong lance of justice hurtless breaks. Armed in rags. A pygmy straw does pierce it. So this is the whole image, uh, the whole idea of image and reality, right? If you're rich and powerful, you've got protection. They can't, you can buy out the law. If you're poor and got holes in your clothes, there's no protection against the law. Which means that those in charge of the law have to do justice, have to be righteous as he was not in the first scene when he banished his daughter, etc. Yeah. That's right. None does offend. None. I say none. I'll able them. I'm going to speak. I'm going to justify 
everyone, every one of these guys. There's no one who offends. Well, what does that sound like? He's beginning to think. Take that of me, my friend, who have the power to seal the accuser's lips. I'm the king. I can seal the accuser's lips. Get thee glass eyes, and like a scurvy politician, seem to see the things thou dost not. Now, 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 pull off my boots. He's barefoot. Harder, harder, so. Edgar, oh, matter and impertinency mixed, reason and madness. Now, why does Shakespeare have him say that? Because this is poetry, and this is profound, and he's meaning stuff, and he wants us to know it. It sounds like madness, and it is madness, but it isn't only madness. It's reason in madness. There's a lot of sense in what he's saying. Uh, none does offend. He's, he's almost sounding Christ-like. I'll able them. I'll be the sacrifice for them. If thou wilt weep, and Gloucester weeps, as well as he can weep with no eyes. If thou wilt weep my fortune, take my eyes. I know thee well enough. Thy name is Gloucester. Thou must be patient. There's that word again. We came crying hither. Thou knowest the first time that we smell the air, we wall and cry. Ha, huh, I'm going to preach to you. Mark, pay attention. That gives me an idea. I'm going to get up and preach like a preacher. Alack, alack the day. And then he starts to preach. When we are born, we cry that we are come to this great stage of fools. And then he interrupts himself. He feels something. This is a good block. I don't know what he's feeling. I think he's feeling the weeds, maybe. It were a delicate stratagem to shoe a troop of horse with felt. I'll put it in proof. I'll test it. And when I've stolen upon these son-in-laws, then kill, 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 kill. What? Didn't I just say he was sounding Christ-like? What's going on? And it's not even the son-in-laws. It's one son-in-law. The other guy's OK. It's the daughters. He's mad. He's furious. He's vengeful. He's raging. Everything is swirling in his head. The most abject, pitying kindness to Gloucester, to everybody, to the poor, which he never was paying attention to before, as he said. And at the same time, this wild, angry, raging revenge. So they come in with, uh, the gentleman comes in with attendants or the soldiers. <clears throat> oh, here he is, lay hand upon him in, for his own good, right? Sir, your most dear daughter, no rescue. He thinks he's being captured now by enemies. What, a prisoner? I am even the natural fool of fortune. Use me well, you shall have ransom. Let me have surgeons and cut to the brains. Gentlemen, you shall have anything. No seconds, all myself. Why, this would make a man a man of salt to use his eyes for garden water pots, uh, I and laying autumn's dust. That, this would make a man weep, remember? Uh, will not, I'll not weep. And because he wouldn't weep, the storm broke and his mind broke. And now he's saying this capture would make him weep. But he changes his mind. I will die bravely, like a smug bridegroom. What? I will be jovial. Come, come. I am a king, masters. Know you that? You are a royal one and we obey you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> then there's life in it. Come, and you get it, you shall get it by running. And he runs off. Chase me. Gentlemen, a sight most pitiful in the meanest wretch, past speaking of in a king. Thou hast one daughter who redeems nature from the general curse which twain have brought, thee, brought her to. All right, so there's going to be a battle.
The gentleman goes out. So now it's Gloucester and Edgar again. And let's see where they are. Gloucester, you ever gentle gods, take my breath from me. Let not my worser spirit tempt me again to die before you please. Well, pray you, Father. Now, good sir, what are you? A most poor man made tame to fortune's blows, who by the art of known and feeling sorrows am pregnant to good pity. Give me your hand, I'll lead you to some biding. Hardy thanks the bounty and benison of heaven to boot and boot. He blesses him. And again, why isn't Edgar telling him who he is at this point? Because he's still the enemy of the English state because of Edmund. So he, it's dangerous to <coughs> Gloucester for him to be known to be Edgar. I never thought of that before. It just came to me. God, Shakespeare's so good. And we know it because Oswald comes in the next moment and says a proclaimed prize, meaning Gloucester. So he's going to kill Gloucester. And Gloucester says, now let thy friendly hand put strength enough to it. Go ahead. And uh, Edgar puts himself in between. Shall not let go, sir, without further occasion. So now he's changing his voice again. He's speaking like an upcountryman. Let go, slave, or thou diest. Good gentlemen, go your gate. Let poor folk pass. And should have been a swaggered out of me life, t'would not have been so long as tis by fortnight. Nay, come not near the old man. Keep out, Chivoria, or I shall try whether your coster to my ballow be the harder. She'll be plain with you. Out, Dunghill, they fight. She'll pick your teeth, sir. Come, no matter for your foins, meaning your fencing gestures. Now, look at Oswald. Remember Oswald when he was challenged to fight Kent? What did he do? Help, help. Murder. Wouldn't draw his sword. Now, he's got a blind man and a peasant. Uh, and he thinks, oh, these will be easy to take. But he doesn't know that he's dealing with the son of the earl, the the heir to the earldom of Gloucester. And of course, Edgar kills him. Slave, thou hast slain me. Villain, take my purse. If ever thou wilt thrive, bury my body and give the leathers which thou findst about me to Edmund, Earl of Gloucester. Seek him out upon the English party. And he dies. Good, good riddance, right? Edgar, I know thee well, a serviceable villain, as duteous to the vices of thy mistress as badness would desire. Sit you down, father, rest you. Let's see these pockets. The letters that he speaks of may be my friends. He is dead. I'm only sorry he had no other deathsman. I'm sorry I'm the one that had to kill him, but I had to kill him. Blame us not to know our enemies' minds. We rip their hearts. Their papers is more lawful. He's not feeling guilty for reading this letter. And the letter is from Goneril to Edmund, and it says, let our reciprocal vows be remembered. You have many opportunities to cut him off, meaning Albany. If your will want not, want not, time and place will be fruitfully offered. There is nothing done if he returned the conqueror. There's that word again. Then am I the prisoner and his bed my jail from the loathed warmth whereof deliver me and supply the place for your labor. Your Wife, so I would say, affectionate servant, Goneril. Oh, indistinguished space of woman's will. Will. Do you remember what will means from Twelfth Night? Will. So the free will, the willfulness, the sexual desire. All of those things are meant here. A plot upon her virtuous husband's life and the exchange, my brother. Gloucester, the king is mad. How stiff is my vile sense that I stand up and have ingenious feeling of my huge sorrows. Better I were distract. So should my thoughts be severed from my griefs and woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. If only I were mad like Lear, I wouldn't be so aware of my misery. Well, I guess... 
Um, we'll finish the Gloucester story when we come to Lear again. So we're in Act Four. Well, he means both. We hear it one way, Gloucester hears it another way. But, but it's doesn't really know it's Edgar. Yet. Not Edgar. I mean Edgar. Not yet. Okay. We're going to find out later what happened when Edgar revealed himself to his father. And we're not going to see it. You know why? Because Shakespeare's going to plant it in our minds with words, and then we're going to see it in Lear and Cordelia. So he tells us what happens to them, and then he shows it happening to them. That's called art. Kent has revealed himself to Cordelia. Don't let on who I am. And then the doctor comes. Uh, Cordelia says at line 14, O oh, you kind gods, cure this great preach in his abused nature. The untuned and jarring senses, O oh, wind up of this child changed father. So they're going to wake the king. They, draw, they play music. Why do they play music? For approximately 3,000 years, maybe only articulated for 2,000 years, 2,500 years, one of the things that music was, was healing. It had healing power because of its harmonies. And we know its harmonies because if I play a C major chord progression and end on the tonic, we all feel satisfied. But if I end on the diminished seventh chord and stop there, we all are driven mad. Nope. Is that all right? What if I don't do that? Can't stand it, can you? OK, so, or I should do that. All right, what's the point? The point is somehow, between us, human beings, and nature, there is this relation to the vibrations of sound. Now, it's true that in the East, the relation to the vibrations is somewhat different, but it's not totally different. And at least Western music um, illustrates the, the um, utter interconnection between the human emotion and the human sense of meaning and these this mathematical, physical facts about vibrations of strings or the air in our ears. So until uh, the 20th century, music was thought to have this amazing power. In addition to the joy, in addition to the meaning, in addition to the variety and all that, it was also thought by many people to have a kind of healing power so that Mad men, mad men, where uh, you, you play, you know, Bach or Mozart to a madman, it calms them and settles them. Um, and if you play Penderecki, you know about Penderecki? Uh, how many of you have a copy of Philip Thompson's book that I edited called Dusk and Dawn? In that, there's a, there's a little essay on Penderecki. Penderecki is a modern Polish composer who uh, went to a madhouse and played some of his wild 20th century non-tonal Schoenberg kind of uh, music. And he recorded the brain waves of the madmen. And then he created a symphony based on those brain waves in his atonal crazy conflicted way and played it in a concert for people dressed up you know, in tuxedos. And uh, Philip quotes somebody coming out of the concert saying, it's an, a remarkable piece of work that I never want to hear again. 
In other words, he is turning from music as healing to music as torture. And he tortures these madmen with their own demons and then records their demons and then tortures the general audience with the same noise. But that's new. Shakespeare doesn't buy that. Shakespeare is still in the world where this music is not just, you know, worldly music that also has healing power. It's a symbol. The fact that we enjoy that resolution of that chord is a symbol that we, in our limited ways, contained by the flesh and stuck in time and space, have this access to perfect harmony, perfect music, the music of the spheres, which we can't hear because we're fallen, but which souls can hear when they exit the, the body and time. And so to play music for the, this madman is to help heal him, in addition to all those elements of nature that help him sleep and so on, that the doctor has um, provided. And the doctor's providing the music, louder the music there, he says. Cordelia, oh my dear father, restoration hang thy medicine on my lips and let this kiss repair those violent harms that my two sisters have in thy reverence made. And she kisses him. Kind and dear princess, Kent is moved. Was this a face to be opposed against the jarring winds? And he wakes up. How does my royal lord, how fares your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. What's the image here? He imagines that he's dead or being kept from being dead first. And then he sees Cordelia and he imagines that she is a soul in bliss, a heavenly being, and that he is being tormented in hell on a wheel of fire, one of the great images of Hades and hell, ancient. Sir, do you know me? You are a spirit, I know. Where did you die? Still, still far wide. He's still far away from sanity. He scarce awake, says the doctor, let him alone a while. Where have I been? Where am I? Fair daylight? I am mightily abused. Now that has two meanings to us. Abused means tricked or fooled. They're fooling me. But of course we know that he's been in the other sense abused. I should even die with pity to see another thus. Do you remember those first words? where he said to the fool, I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. The first time he started feeling for somebody else, really. And now he says, if I saw somebody else in this condition, I would die, with, uh, die of pity. I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. Would I were assured of my condition. Now, if I had Jonathan McMurtry here, he would give us a whole talk about the power of Shakespearean monosyllables. Almost this whole speech is monosyllables. There are a couple of words that are more. But he's, he, I know not what to say. I will not swear these are my hands. Let's see. I feel this pinprick. It's, it's the simplest, purest, most human kind of waking up from this horror that he's been through. Cordelia, oh, look upon me, sir, and hold your hand in benediction o'er me. She wants her father's blessing. And instead he kneels. You must not kneel, she says to him. Pray do not mock me, says he. I am a very foolish, fond old man, four score and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. <clears throat> Do you remember the last time I'm an old man? A poor, despised old man. And yet, he said, 
And then he ended, I am a man more sinned against than sinning. Not this time. I am a very foolish, fond, old man. Four score and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I feel, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. True, true, and true. Methinks I should know you and know this man, meaning Kent. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I do not know where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And so I am, I am. She can do nothing but repeat the simplest thing. She's so overwhelmed. And Shakespeare knows how to reach us. I am, I am, that's it. <clears throat> be your tears wet? What does that mean, be your tears wet? Are you really crying? Yes, Faith. I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause. They have not. She says, no cause, no cause. Now, what would she say if the feminists had got to her? <laughs> it's all your fault. I told you not to do this. You didn't listen. Now we've all suffered. What does she want from him, that feminist? What can she possibly expect or desire? In her cruelty, in her self-regard, in her anger, in her really almost revenge. But that's not Cordelia. No cause, no cause. Am I in France? In your own kingdom, sir. Do not abuse me, don't trick me. Doctor, be comforted, good madam. The great rage you see is killed in him. And yet it is, a, it is danger to make him even or the time he has lost. Don't make him go over what he seems to have forgotten. Desire him to go in, trouble him no more till further settling. Will it please your highness, walk Lear. You must bear with me. Pray you now, forget and forgive. I am old and foolish. All right. <clears throat> what has happened to him? What condition is he in now? I'm talking about his inner life now. We see what he is outside. I am old and foolish. Forget and forgive. Definitely. Repentant, she said. He's purged of the great rage. See, the doctor says, the great rage you see is killed in him. And the doctor just means his madness is over. But we know what his real great rage was. <clears throat> the daughters wouldn't obey him. First Cordelia and then the other two, much worse. I mean, bad instead of her goodness. And then the elements wouldn't obey him. And then he could not accept reality. Who did it? Your son and daughter. No, I, no, I, no, I say. They would not. Yes, they did. Remember that? So now that's gone. That rage that the world isn't going according to his will is killed in him. He's humbled. I am old and foolish. Okay, now. Act five. D does anybody need a break? No, okay. We go on. All right, the, the uh, bad guys are fighting with each other. Of course, Goneril and Regan are fighting over Edmund now. Edgar gives a letter to Albany, before you 
before you fight the battle, open this. If you have victory, let the trumpet sound and I'll, someone will appear. <clears throat> Edmund, it, in the letter, he's accusing Edmund. And Edmund has a soliloquy at the end of Act uh, 5, Scene 1. It's line 56. <clears throat> it's a little touch of comedy at this juncture before we head into the final horror. To both these sisters have I sworn my love, each jealous of the other as the stung are of the adder. Which of them shall I take? Both, one, or neither? Neither can be enjoyed if both remain alive. To take the widow, meaning Regan, exasperates, makes mad her sister Goneril. And hardly shall I carry out my side, her husband being alive. That is how I carry, can't marry Goneril because her husband's still alive. Now then, we'll use his countenance for the battle, which being done, let her who would be rid of him devise his speedy taking off. Let Goneril kill her husband. As for the mercy which he intends to Lear and to Cordelia, the battle done and they within our power shall never see his pardon. For my state stands on me to defend, not to debate. Remember how earnest he was about trying to get Edgar's land? What's he after now? The whole kingdom. So he's going to marry one of the daughters, and he's going to kill King Lear and Cordelia, and then clear path. Uh, Act 5, Scene 2. There's the battle in the background. Edgar to Gloucester. Here, Father, take the shadow of this tree for your good host. Pray that the right may thrive. If ever I return to you again, I'll bring you comfort. Grace go with you, sir. Exit Edgar. Alarm and retreat. Okay, there's war, there's battle, there's trumpets, there's retreat. Edgar comes in. Away, old man, give me thy hand away. King Lear hath lost he and his daughter Tain. And we're thinking, oh my God, how bad can this get? This is just, they don't deserve to lose. But of course, you can't have France defeating England. Give me thy hand, come on. Gloucester says, no further, sir. A man may rot even here. Rot, meaning die and be buried and rot. What, in ill thoughts again? Men must endure their going hence, even as their coming hither. Ripeness is all. Come on. And Gloucester says, and that's true too. Okay. So what does he mean by ripeness? There's a whole book, or at least a whole essay, called Ripeness is All, by a former teacher of mine, named J.V. Cunningham, where he describes the emotional effect of Shakespearean tragedy. And he has a chapter about this line, where he distinguishes between what ripeness means to Shakespeare and his audience and what it means to us. So we think ripeness is good. <laughs> ripeness means you keep growing, you keep getting older, you keep getting wiser. So it's, so what is all is uh, the process of growth, progress, evolution toward ripeness. It's not what Shakespeare means. And we know it because in uh, As You Like It, Jake, says, uh, and, the, and here, there from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. And the tale, he means, is the life of a man. From hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then we die. And then from hour to hour we rot and rot. And we die when we're ripe, like fruit. What happens to fruit? It ripens and ripens until it's ripe. And then it falls off the tree and it rots. So when Edgar says ripeness is all, he means you don't knock yourself off the tree before it's time. You patiently wait for the gods 
to ripen you till it is your time, and then you fall off the tree. It's reminiscent of Hamlet, the readiness is all. So I was just going to say this, because you asked me, somebody did at the beginning, why was I so sure? I think it was you. Why are you so sure King Lear is a greater play than Hamlet? <laughs> was it not you? Anyway, I said, I, I said that uh, I thought Lear was Shakespeare's greatest tragedy. And I think you wrote back, well, what about Hamlet? OK, so Hamlet is Shakespeare's almost greatest tragedy. <laughs> Hamlet says to Horatio in Act 5, scene 2, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. There's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. And then uh, there is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. So what is readiness? It's the exact same sentence, both starting with an R. Ready, the readiness is all, and here we have ripeness is all. So readiness is about the human will. The whole play of Hamlet is about Ham the correction of Hamlet's will. Uh, he has a good will until he's tempted to want to damn the king, and then he falls into an evil will, and that evil will is corrected by the sea voyage and all the providential stuff. We talked about this last year, those who were here, or was it two years ago, <laughs> whenever. And his conclusion is, now I'm ready. Like, my will is turned toward whatever God wills. This is good. This is great. This is profound. But this is a step further in the recognition that we are in the hands of this greater power. And ripeness includes our will, but isn't limited to our will. We are ripened by God, by nature, by time. Uh, and death comes when we are ripe. And that ripeness is all is the awareness of one's relation to the whole thing. It's not any longer as in that play. And I'm not saying Shakespeare, you know, learned a lesson. It's about a different thing. It's a different play on a different, somewhat different subject. And yet this play comes after Hamlet. And I think you could argue that he has taken a step spiritually uh, in this movement from readiness to ripeness. In any case, the theme is applied to not only Gloucester, but to Lear. And we will see ripeness happen in front of our eyes in, in the last scene. OK, Act 5, Scene 3. Uh, they're arrested. Uh, Edmund says, officers, take them away. Keep them under guard. Cordelia says, we are not the first who, with best meaning, have incurred the worst. For thee, oppressed king, I am cast down. Myself could else outfrown false fortunes frown. Uh, in other words, I could bear this patiently. I just feel bad for you. There's Cordelia's love again and her patience. Shall we not see these daughters and these sisters, so-called? Lear. No, 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 no. Come, let's away to prison. We too alone will sing like birds in the cage. When thou dost ask me blessing, I'll kneel down and ask of thee forgiveness. Now, what's wonderful about that is that that's already happened. He's saying he will do it, and he's already done it. We saw him do it in the previous scene. She has asked his blessing benediction, and he has tried to kneel to ask her forgiveness. So he says he's going to do, and he's already done what he says he's going to do. And it's the opposite of the first scene. We are going un to unburden, crawl toward death. We're going to prevent future strife now. All wrong. You can't do that that way. And now it's the opposite. He means to give her a blessing. He means to ask her forgiveness, but 
His will has already turned there. It's, he's already done it. So it's not like speaking and not meaning it. He's already done it, so we know he means it. So we'll live and pray and sing and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies and hear poor rogues talk of court news. And we'll talk with them too, who loses and who wins, who's in, who's out, and take upon us the mystery of things as if we were God's spies. And we'll wear out in a walled prison packs and sects of great ones that ebb and flow by the moon. Upon such sacrifices, my Cordelia, the gods themselves throw incense. Have I caught thee? He that parts us shall bring a brand from heaven and fire us hence like foxes. Wipe thine eyes. The good years shall devour them flesh and fell ere they shall make us weep. We'll see him starved first. Come. Okay, so what is now the relation between King Lear and his daughter Cordelia? Loving. Loving. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter kingdoms and divisions and unburdened crawl. That's got nothing to do with anything. I've got you. Have I caught thee? With you, together, we can outface all of it. It doesn't matter. It's nothing in the face of love. And what has brought him to this was losing everything and becoming nothing. So that word nothing that's been going through the play is a disguise in the hands of the gods. It looks like they're taking everything away from King Lear. What they're taking away from him is his foolish willfulness, his pride, his arrogance, and replacing it with external nothing and even mental nothing purges him. So that what's left is recognizably what really is valuable, and that is love. All right, Edmund sends the captain to go murder them. Uh, and then there's the battle of wits and Goneril and Regan fighting over Edmund and, Ed and Albany, uh, ironically, it's just, Kind of funny how he does it, line 85. For your claims to Goneril, fair sister, I borrowed in the interest of my wife, to, to uh, Regan, he says, for your claim to Edmund, I borrowed in the interest of my wife. Tis she is subcontracted to this Lord, meaning Edmund. And I, her husband, contradict your bands. If you will marry, make your loves to me. My lady is bespoke. It's a joke, right? Edmund's got a claim on my wife before you do, so you better ask me for permission to marry my wife. An interlude, that's what Goneril means. Regan is sick, and Goneril says, if not, I'll ne'er trust medicine. So she's poisoned her own sister. Edgar comes in disguised to challenge Edmund to a duel. Thou art a traitor, false to thy gods, thy brother and thy father, line 135, <clears throat> conspirant against his high, this high illustrious prince, meaning Albany, and from the extremest upward of thy head to the descent and dust below thy foot, a most toad-spotted traitor. Say thou know, this sword, this arm, and my best spirits are bent to prove upon thy heart whereto I speak. Thou liest. Edmund says, no, I'm not. And they fight and Edmund falls. <sighs> this is practice, Gloucester, says Goneril. That is a trick, a plot. By the law of war, thou wast not bound to answer an unknown opposite. Thou art not vanquished, but cousined and beguiled, tricked, fooled, cheated. 
Albany, shut your mouth, dame, or with this paper, that's that letter that Edgar found. I'll stop it. Read thine own evil. No tearing, lady, I perceive you know it. She says, the laws are mine, not thine. Who can arraign me for it? Most monstrous. Knowest thou this paper? Ask me not what I know. She goes out. Go after her. She's desperate, govern her. Edmund, what you have charged me with, that have I done. Why is he all of a sudden admitting it? That's right. One very simple reason. He's on his deathbed or floor. And Shakespeare's whole tradition is that um, you have nothing to lose telling the truth if you're already dying. Um, and sometimes the awareness that you're going to judgment gets you to repent before the last minute. Of course, they don't have that doctrine. This is, uh, as Laurie reminded us, pre Christian times, the play is set in. <clears throat> but he says, what you have charged me with, that have I done, and more, much more. The time will bring it out, tis past, and so am I. But what art thou that hast this fortune on me? If thou art noble, I do forgive thee. Let's exchange charity, says Edgar, in a pre-Christian world. Caritas, care, love. It's the English translation of the Bible uh, word for um, agape, the Greek agape, selfless love. I am no less in blood than thou art, Edmund. If more, the more thou art wronged me. My name is Edgar and thy father's son. The gods are just and of our pleasant vices make instruments to plague us. Just what Regan had said, remember? The dark and vicious place where thee he got cost him his eyes. Thou hast spoken right, tis true. The wheel is come full circle, I am here. The wheel of fortune has come full circle. But there's a bigger wheel than the wheel of fortune. And it's the wheel of justice. My students will all say, oh, karma. And I am repeatedly telling them, well, Shakespeare didn't know the word karma because he wasn't familiar with Hindu uh, philosophy and Sanskrit terminology. But yeah, you get what's coming to you one way or another. Yes, the whirly gig of time, just what uh, Festi had said. Where have you hid yourself? How have you known the miseries of your father? By nursing them, my Lord, list a brief tale, and when tis told, oh, that my heart would burst. So now we're going to hear what happened with Gloucester at the end. The bloody proclamation to escape that followed me so near. Oh, our lives' sweetness, that we the pain of death would hourly die rather than die at once taught me to shift into a madman's rags, to assume a semblance that very dogs disdained. And in this habit met I my father with his bleeding rings, their precious stones new lost, became his guide, led him, begged for him, saved him from despair, Never, O oh fault, revealed myself unto him until some half hour passed, half an hour ago when I was armed, not sure, though hoping of this good success, that is to defeat Edmund in a single combat. I asked his blessing and from first to last told him our pilgrimage. But his flawed heart, a lack too weak, the conflict to support, Twixt two extremes of passion, joy and grief, burst smilingly. Gloucester dies. Of course, the modern doctor will tell me it was a heart attack. Okay. He dies betwixt the two extremes of passion, joy at the recovery of his son, and his son's love for him 
and hearing the story of his being saved from despair and from death <clears throat> by Edgar. And grief. What's the grief? Forget the blindness at this point. What has he done to Edgar? What has he forced him to go through by his own blindness? Grief at his blindness, not physical blindness, but moral blindness. He betrayed his own son. Yeah. So he dies of these opposite extremes of passion. We are meant in all the classic tradition and religious tradition down until Romanticism um, in the late 18th century, not to go to extremes, but to find the golden mean, to find the mean that is golden. And I just heard Mary Holmes' uh, audio tape today talking about Romanticism, and she was talking about the golden mean and how difficult it is in our time to believe in the golden mean. We think that any mean is boring and dull because we're romantics, we're products of Romanticism for 200 years. And we worship extremes of all kinds, extremes of emotion, extremes of politics, extremes of the physical world. We want to be in raging cataracts or violent storms or out in the wilderness where no human foot has fallen before instead of a nice, you know, sweetly tended garden that has all those medicines in it that the doctor is using to save King Lear. No, boring. We want wildness, we want extremity. And Gloucester is dying of extremes. Two opposite extremes conflicted in his heart and he dies of it. Passion, two passions, one joy and one grief. Now Edmund says, torturing us, this speech of yours hath moved me and shall perchance do good, but speak you on. You look as you had something more to say. Edgar says, this would have seemed a period to such as love not sorrow, but another to amplify too much would make much more and top extremity. Whilst I was big in clamor, weeping over his father's death, came there in a man who, having seen me in my worst estate, shunned my abhorred society, but then finding who twas that so endured, with his strong arms he fastened on my neck and bellowed out as he'd burst heaven, threw him on my father, told the most piteous tale of Lear and him that ever ear received, which recounting his grief grew puissant, powerful, and the strings of life began to crack. Twice then the trumpets sounded and there I left him tranced. He has a, an attack. But who was this? Kent, sir, the banished Kent, who in disguise followed his enemy king and did him service improper for even for a slave. Enter a gentleman with a bloody knife. What do we think? What? And Cordelia. Help, help, oh help, what kind of help? Speak, man, what means this bloody knife? Tis hot, it smokes. It came even from the heart of, oh, she's dead. Look how he's drawing it out. Who? Your lady, sir, your lady, Goneril. And her sister by her is poisoned. She confesses it. <sighs> well, that's what they deserved. Okay, there's still some hope. Edmund, I was contracted to them both, all three now marry in an instant. Here comes Kent. <sighs> Albany's not touched with pity for the sisters. Kent says, I am come to bid my king and master a, meaning forever, good night. Is he not here? Albany, great thing of us forgot. Well, you can see why. There's been a lot of distraction. But nonetheless, we're feeling, come on. Speak, Edmund, where's the king and where's Cordelia? Now, more interruptions. See you, thou this object can't, alack, why thus? Yet Edmund was beloved, he says, the one the other poisoned for my sake and after slew herself. I pant for life. Some good I mean to do, despite of mine own what? Nature. What's his goddess? Thou nature, 
art my goddess. Denying all responsibility for his soul, for its morality or immorality. He's just going to do what serves his external life, his nature. And now he's going to act with goodness despite his nature, which he could have done all along but chose not to do. So that the doctrine of the free will is embedded in the life of Edmund. And he's only learning it on his deathbed. Some good I mean to do despite of mine own nature. Quickly send, be brief in it to the castle, for my writ is on the life of Lear and on Cordelia. He says, he hath my commission to hang Cordelia in the prison and blame her own despair. Enter Lear. Okay, so monosyllables. Uh, this is how Anthony Hopkins comes in saying the word. Howl. 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 This is how Olivier comes in and says it. Howl! Etc. So you can take your choice. <clears throat> oh, you are men of stones. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. Cordelia, he means. She's in his arms. The actor who plays Lear is always old in our time. I don't know why they don't think they can make someone up to look old, but anyway, they all want to wait to play Lear till they're older, and then when they're older, they've got to carry Cordelia in at the end after four hours of yelling on the stage. And so they always want this tiny little Cordelia. So in every... <laughs> production on the stage, you've got these great horrifying sisters, Regan and Goneril, and then they're <laughs> three foot six Cordelia, so you can carry her. I'm exaggerating a little, but it's a kind of trope in the acting world. She was little in the, yeah. in the Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. She wasn't little in the, in the uh, Ian McKellen, <laughs> but I didn't see the ending, so I don't know. He carried her in. Good. So he did it before. Yeah. He howled. Good. All right. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. Well, there's so much going on here. Okay, this is reminiscent of when he was mad. So we had all that I'll able him stuff, none does offend, and then we had kill, 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 kill. And here we've got she's dead, give me a looking glass, maybe she's alive. So we have these two kind of opposite things, this, this despair and horror, not despair literally, but her, his sorrow and anguish at her death. After, after all that, he found her and they were together and now they've killed her. And so he's howling, or at least he's calling on us to howl. And then in the next instant, give me a looking glass. Maybe she's alive. Kent, is this the promised end? Is this what the end of the world looks like? And Edgar, or image of that horror. That is, is the world really ending now? given what Ke Lear has been through and now what he's going through and what he looks like. Or, and Edgar says, or image of that horror, just an image of the end of the world. Albany, fall and cease. Let me fall and cease. I, they just can't bear it. They want to die. Edgar had said it before. Lear, this feather stirs. She lives. If it be so, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Now, I want you to contemplate the weight of this line. The key word is redeem. If she's alive, it redeems all Sorry. It redeems all sorrows that ever I have felt. 
Where is the value then? Where does he place value? On his beloved daughter Cordelia, with whom he is now uh, before the end at one. And to have her alive is everything. Forget the sisters. Forget the kingdom. None of it matters. If she's alive, it is a chance which does redeem all sorrows that ever I have felt. Is it possible to redeem all the sorrows of the world? Is it possible to redeem all the sorrows of King Lear? If she's alive, he says yes. Kent, oh my good master, prithee away. Tis noble Kent, your friend. A plague upon you, murderers, traitors all. I might have saved her. Now she's gone forever. But he doesn't believe that yet either. Cordelia, Cordelia, stay a little. Huh? What is it thou sayest? Her voice was ever soft, gentle, and low. An excellent thing in woman. Remember what Cordelia said in the first scene? Nothing, my lord. I killed the slave that was a hanging thee. Tis true, my lords, he did. Did I not, fellow? I have seen the day with my good biting falchion. That's a dagger. I would have made them skip. I am old now, and these same crosses spoil me. He doesn't even know what he means, but the word is in, 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 irresistible. These same crosses spoil me. The agonies he's had to go through in life. The punishments for man's sin. Does the cross represent, there it is if you want to look at one, the evil and uh, agony of life, the cost of sin. Yes, but it also represents the redemption from that sin. Through what? Through what? This is everything I've been aiming toward from the first night we talked about this play, through suffering. So that suffering becomes not simply punishment, not simply accident, not simply the consequences of error, but a purgatorial vehicle of redemption. Lear has to be made nothing of until he can realize the love of his daughter, until he can realize the essential uh, nature and meaning and value of a good will. You're always one step ahead of me. <laughs> but you're right. All right. He says, I am old now and these same crosses spoil me. Who are you? He says to Kent, mine eyes are not of the best. I'll tell you straight. There's that humility. If fortune brag of two she loved and hated, one of them we behold. This is a dull sight. Are you not Kent? Your servant Kent. Where is your servant Caius? He's a good fellow, I can tell you that. He'll strike him quickly too. He's dead and rotten. No, my good Lord, I am the very man. Lear, I'll see that straight. I'll look, I'll look into that in a minute. That from your first of difference and decay have followed your sad steps. You are welcome hither. Nor no man else. All's cheerless, dark, and deadly. Your eldest daughters have fordone themselves and desperately are dead. Aye, so I think. <laughs> he knows not what he says. Well, that's true. But when he says it to us, we hear it in a very different way. They have desperately are dead. They've foredone themselves. They've ruined themselves, killed themselves, and desperately are dead. In despair, they've died and killed themselves. And they're damned for it, as the audience knows. And Lear says, aye, so I think, yeah. He's not aware that they've killed themselves. He's not aware of any of the facts. But he's agreeing. Yep, that's right. He knows not what he says, and vain it is that we present us to him. Very bootless. Fruitless. Edmund is dead. 
That's but a trifle here. Albany, for us, we will resign during the life of this old majesty to him our absolute power. Oh, that sounds familiar. Is that a good idea? Does life keep repeating itself? History keep doing the same thing over and over? Not that Albany's in the wrong. Kent and Edgar are probably the good, the best people to be able to run the kingdom. To you, to your rights with boot and such addition as your honors have more than merited. No, I got it wrong. He's resigning to the king, his absolute power, meaning he's resigning to Lear. That's okay, except that he doesn't, he's not aware that Lear is about to die. He's going to give to Edgar and Kent their rights with boot and such addition as your honors have more than merited. All friends shall taste the wages of their virtue and all foes the cup of their deserving. Well, that's good. Albany's a good guy and he's talking about the world and the kingdom, but he's also echoing for us this universal principle. All shall taste the wages of their virtue and all foes, that is all friends, shall taste the wages of their virtue and all foes the cup of their deservings. The principle of justice will hold even though the doctrine of God's rule of the world hasn't been given yet. Oh, see, see, they look at Lear. And my poor fool is hanged. So that reminds us of the fool, it's true. But he literally means this as an endearment to Cordelia because we don't have any sign that the fool has been literally hanged. Cordelia literally has been hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? Thou'lt come no more. Never, 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 never. Pray you undo this button. What does that mean? having a heart attack. I can't breathe. Undo this button. But what button is it? It's that invisible button that ties the soul to the body. And he needs to be released. He doesn't mean that consciously. We can't help hearing it. And this is Shakespeare at his greatest, setting things up so that the simplest phrase and the simplest gesture carries this huge meaning to it. Profound, absolute meaning. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Then suddenly, do you see this? Look on her, look her lips. Look there, look there. What does he think he sees? She's alive. He dies. Okay, hold the place. And go back two pages, three, four pages, to Edgar's description of the death of Gloucester. What did he tell us? His flawed heart, too weak the conflict to support, twixt two extremes of passion, joy, and grief, burst smilingly. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. Never, 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 she's dead. Look there, look there, she lives. And his heart bursts. But there's a different dimension here. For Gloucester, it was the joy and grief of Ed, everything Edgar has revealed to him, of, of his whole life, what he's done, and what Edgar's been to him. And for Lear, now, here, Is Cordelia dead or not? Well, they don't know it because this is a pre-Christian world, but a Christian world knows that she's alive in the soul. And he almost sees that. He thinks he's seeing her alive in the flesh, but that's not where she's alive. So he dies between these two extremes of passion, the grief that she's dead and the joy that she's alive. And then he dies and 
The last thing he has seen was her alive. And it's almost as if he's entered heaven before his body was quite dead. Ah, here we are, alive in the real spiritual meaning of it. So that all of those generations of people for the last, I don't know, say 200 years or at least 150, it's about as old as I am, who have been saying that this play is bleak, that this play is dark, it's empty. It shows Shakespeare aware of modern existentialist philosophy that the world is ultimately meaningless and filled with horror and every happy ending is an illusion. And they beat that into our heads over and over and over and they're lying. It's not what Shakespeare means. In fact, it's the opposite. He's saying, look, the Christian idea of the nature of man is true. And I'm going to show you that it's true because I'm going to show you its truth in a world that doesn't even know that it's true theologically. They don't know the doctrine. They haven't yet been illuminated by the Gospels. But the structure of reality hasn't changed. It was always this. It was always that God created us to be purged of our pride and our sin through suffering, if not through our own will. That is the correction of our will. And the reward of that purgation is reunion, is heaven, is love. He faints, my Lord. No, he faints, my Lord, my Lord. Kent, break heart, I prithee break. Look up, my Lord, says Edgar. Always the one to say, keep going, right? Keep going. Kant says, vex not his ghost. Oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. Edgar, he is gone indeed. It's not up to me. The wonder is he hath endured so long. He but usurped his life. He should have been dead long before this. Well, he wasn't dead till he was ripe to be dead and not according to his schedule or Cordelia's or Edmund's or even Kent's, but according to the invisible schedule, not in our hands. Ripeness is all. Bear them from hence, our present business is general woe. Now, Albany says, friends of my soul, you twain rule in this realm and the gourd state sustain. You guys stick around and help rule the realm. And Kent says, I have a journey, sir, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. Now, who's his master? Well, he thinks his master is King Lear, of course. But he's a pre-Christian. But what is, who is called the master? Christ, every, uh, every echoing term of master, we'll see it uh, Tuesday in the beginning of the tempest, the master of the ship. So he knows that he's being called by his master, and if he imagines his master to be King Lear or God, he doesn't say. He does say, I must not say no. Edgar ends the play, the weight of this sad time we must obey, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most, we that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. Okay, so I promised you a happy ending <laughs> of a kind. Shakespeare is aware that the happy ending is not on this side of the grave for many people, including many good people. But anybody who says that this play is about the onward and downward uh, agony of man into nothingness is not reading properly. Because the built-in principle that this play 
is trying to reveal to us, not by preaching at us, but precisely by not preaching at us, by telling us a story set in a world that didn't know this story of redemption. He's trying to show us that it's true because it's built into the nature and the structure of reality. That because Lear does what he does in the first act, he suffers what he suffers in the third act. And that suffering cures him, purges him, turns him, his will, that is, his ego, his pride, his image of himself to nothing. And only when his image of himself is reduced to nothing is he capable of rediscovering what really matters to him, which in his case is represented by Cordelia, that is the capacity to love um, and, and to love in a sense selflessly. Okay, I think I'll stop there and take questions. Yes. Nothing major. Well, I, I need to mull it over. When you were talking about the button. Yes. And you were saying that that was, where am I? Pray you undo this button. Yeah, undo the button. And you were saying, what about the button? You were saying it's... It's, it, it it's a visible button and it's an right. invisible button. The invisible part. So okay. visibly, it's the button that ties his shirt and he's having a heart attack and he wants to breathe. The invisible button is whatever thing it is that ties our soul to our body. And death unbuttons us, let's say, when we're ripe, to mix my metaphor. <laughs> it's just so wonderful. As usual, it's always just a completely different play than the one I've read and or ever studied before. So, and that's because of my principle that when you walk into the theater in our time, you carry with you a whole lot of ideas and assumptions and presumptions that are different from those that Shakespeare's audience carried into the theater when they went in. Now, there are a lot of things that are the same. You know, rain and wind and fire are the same. And suffering and loss and love and betrayal and so on. Those don't change. But what changes is the terminology. And so you need to get back to understand what the thing means in context in order to get the point of the play. And if you ignore that, you just interpret it with our own baggage. And then you get, the, you know, the Peter Brook existentialist, horrific, ugly, uh, despairing, meaningless universe of King Lear. And that doesn't exist. That is not Shakespeare's universe. It may be ours, but here we have an image of a, of, of a universe that isn't that thing. And I think that's valuable to us, even if we don't want to believe it. Questions? It's pretty overwhelming. <laughs> it's pretty overwhelming. It's pretty overwhelming. Well, I thank you. Correct. That's exactly right. And what is it that makes the difference between that early Lear and the late Lear? What's the difference? Suffering. 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 Anguish. Loss. Can you make no use of nothing, Nuncle? No, fool. Nothing can be made of nothing. Not, not right. There is no nothing. In the hands of God, there's no such thing as nothing. Right? God brings the world into existence out of nothing, but then there is not nothing anymore. So what looks to us like nothing, loss, reduction, is used. It's, it's the vehicle, it's the meaning, or the, the means of bringing us to something from the illusion of nothing. Because the guy like the eels. 
like the eels in the paste. Remember the woman who tried to beat the eels down, down wantons down. He won't lie down. He won't shut up. He, his words so move us. His situations, his characterizations, his poetry will not sh shut up and do what the directors want. So it's just the artistry, the poetry, not so much the message. It's everything. There's no difference. The thing is that, that a great work of art makes no distinction between its form and its content. That's how we know it's, it's one of the signs of greatness, is that we, if we try to separate them, the thing falls apart. It doesn't exist. Pray you undo this button is a perfect example. Uh, you could talk all you want about the technique of that simple sentence as compared with all this great poetry that surrounds it. So yeah, there's simplicity in it. Um, but it carries this overwhelming power in the context. And it's the context of the whole poetry of the play and the whole meaning of the play, which are really inseparable. And that's why nothing can kill Shakespeare. As long as people read and speak English, if Shakespeare is going to be alive and well, despite what people do to him. Now, uh, two or three ages of ignorance um, could kill it. It's pretty much killed Dante, except for the people who study Dante intentionally. You don't, I mean, in Italy, they're still quoting Dante all over the country all the time. But, in America, who, who reads Dante anymore? I mean, if, unless you're at a Catholic they university. They talk about the circles of hell. They do, that's true. Well, but some go to hell because they don't read them, don't even know what they are. Yeah. The kids don't talk about the circles of hell. They never heard of um, of Plato and Aristotle are still around for the people who are studying it, but who's studying it? So I can't swear that Shakespeare won't someday be lost in a barbaric age, which has forgotten everything. Um, well, even in public schools, it was required reading to Julius Caesar in ninth grade, and now they replaced it with Maya Angelou. <laughs> for, for all, for all the chair of my last English department said it doesn't matter whether we taught Hamlet or Beloved as long as they learned skills. <laughs> And the irony is, they're not only not learning Hamlet, they're not learning skills. So it's, it's a, we're going through a time of darkness, and Martin Buber called it the, the eclipse of God, and we're, it's something like that, but it's now becoming the eclipse of all traditional education. But I don't think, I, I don't think it's decisive or final. I just don't think it can be. These works are too great, and when anybody who cares at all about truth, sits down to read one, he's going to start asking questions and going and trying to figure it out. So, but in practice, despite all of this negativity that's piled up, audiences still respond to the moving scenes that they're given. And, and uh, Shakespeare speaks to us, even though we can get it wrong if we don't hear it the way he meant it it still has power, which is why you're here. You see, if Shakespeare didn't speak to you at all, there's no way that I could speak to you. It, it, if, if you reading this thing weren't some way moved by it in your own self, there's no preaching I could do that would make it happen. But when I read it, I'm reading his words and they get you. And so then I have a platform on which I can say, okay, look, here's what he's meaning. Here's how it develops. Here's the background and so on. Um, if it, it, you know, I could talk till the cows came home and if I, if I read you some modern poetry, um, you're, you wouldn't come back for more. And with each decade, having been doing this with you for 23 years, I'm counting my daughter's age and Okay. <laughs> There is always more. Because with, God willing, growth, you see and, and feel it 
entirely different thing. That Absolutely you right. That's the beauty. You can understand the plays on so many so different many levels. levels. Yes. You know, and I think that's, I mean, when they were first performed in, at the Globe, you know, there, people are just, you know, throwing whatever and just, you know, it, they weren't studying the words. They were, they were watching the actor. They right. Were, understanding it in the... You mean Shakespeare's globe. Shakespeare's yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's right. And everybody knew that this was the best thing going. It's simply everybody knew it. And that's why so many people tried to publish things under Shakespeare's name <laughs> that weren't by Shakespeare because they knew it would sell. <laughs> but uh, I think I said to someone last week, the reason I decided to study Shakespeare in graduate school was that I knew that he would wear me out before I wore him out. <laughs> And it's true, There's, it, it's never, I've never exhausted uh, uh, work by Shakespeare. It's, it's not possible. Even just a sonnet, as many times as I teach a sonnet, I heard the, um, they did a celebrity sonnets down at the San Diego Globe Theater a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago. And people came up, various celebrities came up to read sonnets and some were well done and some were not. But, uh, one of them, Charles Janos, who is an actor you've seen many times on the Globe stage, read Sonnet 116, which is the most, probably the most well-known, and which I've taught probably 40 times or more, um, and which I love and which I read aloud. He read it in a way which just knocked me off my pins. And it, it was as if I'd never heard it before, and it was so sublime. And I mean, it, it wasn't like there was anything new in it. Which one is it? It's 116. <laughs> Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Um, anyway, so it, it, it's inexhaustible because a new imagination comes along and can bring it alive in a new way. Laurie, you had a question. Yes, I did. I feel like didn't, didn't you pause and say, ah, I never thought about this? Yes. <laughs> this, what exactly were you? Um, that Edgar, that, uh, that um, what was the line? I have insights, but I don't have any memory. <laughs> uh, it was Ed just before, at the very end, wasn't it? Close to the end. Uh, what was the line of Edgar? I don't remember. <laughs> we'll go back in the tape and we'll find it and then I'll let you know. <laughs>